coming up on Newsnight, we bring back the panel and we talk about Doug Prade's release. We talk about the governor's education spending plan and his budget. And we also talk about First Energy Stadium, home of the Cleveland Browns. That's next on Newsnight. Welcome to Newsnight for February 8th, and we're very glad to have you with us. You know, it's always a pleasure to welcome some of my journalist colleagues to sit down and have a panel discussion about recent news events, and there have been a lot of news events in the past couple of weeks, so we're going to get right to it. I'm very glad to always welcome Steve Hoffman, political and editorial writer with The Beacon Journal, and we want to welcome Doug Livingston, who is the education writer with The Beacon. Doug, welcome. And, uh, of course, the dean of newsmen in the Akron area, Larry States. Larry, it's great to have you here with us. Well, the thing we want to talk about first is the news that came out last week when Doug Prade was released from prison. Now, you'll remember Doug was uh, convicted in the murder of his former wife, Margot Prade. He spent nearly 15 years in prison, and he was released last week. Um, Larry, set the stage for us. Describe for some of our viewers maybe what happened in this case. Well, it was back in 1997. Uh, Dr. Margot Prade had a successful uh, practice as a doctor here in Akron. Uh, she and uh, Doug Prade had, had gone through a very nasty divorce. Um, Doug Prade was being groomed as possibly the next police chief in the city of Akron. Uh, he was a captain in the police department, had a good record as a captain in the police department. Uh, the couple, though, uh, there were rumblings about the, the, you know, the, the domestic disputes that they had, uh, uh, some other problems going on in their marriage at the time. Uh, saying it was a bitter divorce is probably an understatement. Uh, there, there was a lot of uh, there were threats that were being made. Uh, many say by Doug Prade on the life of Mar uh, Dr. Margot Prade. Uh, Dr. Prade had uh, was ready to announce that she was uh, marrying a Columbus attorney at the time, and uh, that announcement was about to be made uh, before she was uh, killed, before she was murdered. So there was a lot of um, uh, there was a lot of things that boiled under the surface before this all happened. And it shocked a lot of people because uh, in, in my dealings with Doug Prady, he'd always been very straight arrow, very professional, but, you know, yet a lot was not known about his personal life at the time until it all started to come out in the divorce proceedings with Dr. Margot Prade. Both of them were successful professionally, and uh, it just came to the point where uh, they, 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 you know, they were incompatible with each other, and, uh, but still Doug Prade did not want to get divorced at the time. You know, he, he uh, felt that there were other uh, factors at work that, convinced Dr. Margot Prade to divorce him, and uh, as a result, uh, he was accused of stalking her, of threatening her, of uh, he was uh, convicted of illegally wiretapping her phone calls. He recorded several hundred of them, I guess, at the time. And so, you know, you had a lot of things that led up to this that were happening at that time, and they all came out, of course, after she was murdered. Uh, she was... Um, uh, getting out of a van on, uh, which is now Vernon Odom Boulevard, which was Worcester Road at that time, Worcester Avenue at that time, uh, coming out of her office when uh, someone attacked her uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, there was some security video of it, very fuzzy at the time. Doug Prade claims it wasn't him, but the, uh, they linked him through a lot of other evidence and his whereabouts at the time of the slaying, and they linked him to the slaying of his, uh, his ex-wife. Uh, he maintained his innocence throughout the years. He, as soon as he went to prison, he said, I didn't do this. And he was in the courtroom when he was convicted of the murder. He turned to Margot Prade's mother. He looked at her and he said, uh, Margot knows I didn't do this. Okay, Margot knows I didn't do this. Someone else did this and Margot knows it. You should know it too. I did not kill, you know, Margot. That was what was said by him at the time before he was let out of the courtroom. And he maintained that throughout the 15 years he was in prison. He tried very, very unsuccessfully for several years to be uh, proven innocent. He wanted DNA evidence tested, and then the Ohio Innocence Project got involved. And when that happened, uh, things started rolling for him, and uh, he insisted on DNA testing. He said, if you do DNA testing, you'll find I was not at the murder scene. So that's, that's in a nutshell, that's basically what led up to uh, the uh, hearing on the DNA evidence, and then uh, Judge Hunter's decision to release him and exonerate him of his wife's murder, which shocked a lot of people because of all the other evidence uh, against him that was, you know, some of it circumstantial, some of it, you know, hard evidence they had of his whereabouts at the time, the threats that he had made, the wiretapping, all of that all together made a very convincing case against him. 
Well, well, well the, I think what happened in the end here is that uh, some of this earlier evidence uh, really began to uh, fall apart once this DNA uh, evidence was done. And we spent quite a bit of time with uh, the prosecutor and uh, mm -hmm. her chief assistant going over this new DNA evidence. And Hunter's decision is, is pretty methodical. I think the surprise here, a lot of us thought that Prade would get a new trial out of this. Right. And what was somewhat surprising was that Judge Hunter, you know, went further. Said he was innocent. Yeah, right. To me, after this long and very technical discussion about DNA evidence, which uh, the average juror, I, I guarantee you, they, they may hear it again in a retrial if, the, if their appeal is successful. But it's very, very technical. It's very, very hard for the average person to understand. Uh, uh, the prosecutor uh, uh, is basically saying that this evidence is virtually meaningless. This new evidence is virtually meaningless on very, very technical grounds. Here's the fundamental problem that they, they would have going forward, in my opinion. The bite mark evidence is shaky. Mm -hmm. The video evidence is shaky. The eyewitness testimony is shaky. People make threats all the time in domestic violence cases. What you do have for certain is that, there, that what a jury would understand, in my opinion, is there was more DNA testing mm -hmm. uh, of where this lab coat was bitten, and the result of this further testing was no Doug Prade. But, but wasn't, <laughs> wasn't the, isn't the prosecutor's contention that, that the lab coat was contaminated, that it was handled so, over so many years? Okay, well, so what? It, do, it, it doesn't matter. Couldn't that, have, couldn't that have taken Doug Prade's DNA off that coat, they didn't off that mark? I'm saying that if the bottom line would be, if you presented this evidence to a jury, the bottom line would, would be we did more testing mm -hmm. on this lab coat. None of the DNA we found can be matched to Doug Prade, and that, I guarantee you, is what would stick in a juror's the mind. The question is, they found other DNA, but who, you know, who does that DNA belong to? Whose DNA is that? That's the next question that needs to be answered. And uh, the, as a matter of fact, Doug Prade and his attorneys in the Ohio Innocence Project have requested that the investigation be reopened into the murder case. They have specifically requested that. That was one of the first things that Doug Prade said coming out. He said, I want, I'd like to see this case reopened to find the real killer. So, you know, if, that, if he's that confident going forward that they should reopen the case and re-examine it again, you wonder, you know what I mean? Well, in our system of justice, and we've got to remind everybody, in our system of justice, if you're accused, your job is, is not to find the other person who yeah. did it. Your, your job is to put on the best defense, throw doubt, reasonable doubt, and, and uh, this DNA testing, and, I mean, created plenty of doubt, at least in Judge Hunter's mind. And I will give her credit for a very methodical... Analysis, analysis of this. Because this all took place last October, did it not, when right. she had... Um... Right. And the, the Innocence Project, I mean, the role that they played in this uh, is just, uh, you know, the, 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 the attorneys who are part of the Innocence Project know how to do their job. I mean, they really do. And, uh, you know, they use, they, they rely very heavily on DNA evidence, but that's something, you know, that we keep having forensic advancements mm -hmm. almost annually in how uh, crime scenes can be tested, how DNA can be tested, and they're getting better and better and better at being able to isolate DNA and being able to, uh, to, to you know, uh, cancel people out as far as being suspects. And once again, uh, you know, Doug Prade even said this himself. He says, how many other people have been wrongfully in prison, you know, because we didn't have, they didn't have that technology back there. They didn't have that testing. Right. Oh, well, we got about a minute left in this segment of the program, and I want, but I want to ask you two questions. Would trying him again be double jeopardy? And, and, and what, what will Sherry Bevan Walsh do in this case? Will she appeal this, this she decision by Judge yeah. Hunter? She has appealed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she definitely has. They, they okay. filed with the Ninth District Court of Appeals almost immediately. Now, the timetable for that, we talked to Brad Gessner, who's sort of the point man for the prosecutor's office on this uh, case. He said that could be months, it could be a year, it could be longer than that. In the meantime, though, they tried to get Doug Prade to remain in prison. They, they went before Judge Hunter. She turned it down. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, I guess they could do that with the Ninth District Court of Appeals, depending on when, when the case is heard. But in the meantime, he's free. Okay. You know, he, he's a free man. He could be a free man for a year. He could be a free man for several months until this case goes before the Ninth District Court of Appeals. Now, if they throw out, uh, you know, Judge Hunter's ruling, then that's a new trial, because she also made the provision that if her ruling was overturned, that he would get a new trial. 
Um, I, I do need to move on, unfortunately. Um, and, and Governor Kasich has been very busy in the past week uh, with his education spending plan and with, with his $63.3 billion budget. Steve, is, is the budget um, a combination of, what, tax increases and tax decreases? Yeah, this is uh, a, a lot of moving parts uh, in this, and I, I'll leave the education piece to Doug, who actually uh, understands it. Um, the, the governor be it benefits from this kind of mentality that after uh, the current biennium that we're in, uh, schools got whacked, local governments got whacked. I mean, it was some pretty serious budget cutting. We had a projected $8 billion deficit, as you recall, going into this current biennium. So everyone, you know, got hit pretty hard. So now they're not getting hit as hard as they thought they might have been. So things look okay. You know what I mean? It's like, well, people wait, are more willing to accept things right, as they are. Right. Um, I, I guess the, the, the main point that I'd like to make about the budget overall, um, the governor is insistent on cutting the income tax again. Mm -hmm. We've been through an income tax cut, a series of income tax cuts going back to 2005. Now we're going to have more. And don't forget, he, he promised that when he was running for governor. Yeah. He said, uh, you know, we're going to have income tax cuts. So. And so this would be somewhat offset, uh, but not entirely, by an increase in the severance tax on the oil and gas drillers, which will be fought uh, tooth and nail and an interesting reduction of the state sales tax, but a broadening of the base. Uh, and, the, and actually, the broadening of the base is a good thing. The economy has changed quite a bit in Ohio, so the governor is proposing to extend the sales tax to some services, not all services. We've become a more service-oriented mm -hmm. economy. Um, services, the, though, like, like accountants, like uh, lawyers. Right. Nothing, what is it, health, I don't think. Health is Nothing exempt. education. Correct. And that right. kind of stuff, but but most services would now be taxed. Yeah, uh, a sales tax is a regressive tax. So really, you're you're giving wealthier people by giving them an income tax break and also a 50 percent reduction in small business taxes, which mainly go to wealthier people, small business owners, mm -hmm. and then you're you're um, broadening the sales, the reach of the sales tax, which is a, a more regressive form of taxation. So there are a lot of questions about how all these. Uh, parts will fit together. I do want to say one other thing real quickly, uh, another very good point in this budget and which surprised a lot of people was the governor's decision to expand uh, the Medicaid, Medicaid coverage, yes. which is which is huge. Uh, this, the federal government is going to pick up between 90 and 100 percent of the cost. There are projections that Ohio will actually come out ahead uh, in this uh, net uh, plus, mm -hmm. but it basically what it does is it expands Medicaid to a higher level of uh, poverty. Uh, you can be above the poverty line and, and still be eligible I think they for said a family of four could make up to $92,000 and still qualify for Medicaid. I mean, that seems stunning to us that somebody making that income could, but I guess with the cost of medical care today, with everything else that's, that's sure. happening, they're raising the, the percentage of poverty is going up, yeah. you know, that they're, that, uh, the qualified uh, income. Yeah. One other question, though. When you crunch all the numbers, okay, with the taxes he's cutting, the income taxes that he's cutting from small businesses and individuals, and then the, the, um, the sales tax that he's going to drop from five and a half statewide to five, but, but expanding that, do the numbers match? Do, uh, do the numbers all come down so that there's still money coming in? I mean, we're going to be more of a... Is, is the state of Ohio going to be dependent on sales tax as our main source of revenue, is what I, I guess I'm asking. Well, there'll be a net reduction... When you do all these all these number crunchings, my understanding there'll be a net reduction over the two years of about eight hundred and eighty million dollars. The okay. net a net tax cut. Okay. But yes, we the the short answer to your question is yes, we'll be less reliant on the income tax, more reliant on the sales on the tax. Sales tax. Doug, I want to bring you in here. You you are the education guru. Sure. So so along with obviously his budget, the the governor came out with an education spending plan. Give us a thumbnail sketch of what he wants to do now with education. Um, when we look at the education budget overall, we have to remember that the governor did cut $1.6 billion in the first biennium budget. Um, that was to make up that $8 billion shortfall that Steve was talking about. Um, he is uh, touting $1.2 billion in additional spending in this biennium budget. Um, but there are some, when we start getting into the details, we start to see the priorities and where the money is going to. and. and we can see, if we take a bird's eye view of the budget, where he's funneling money. Um, we know that um, charter school expansion um, is uh, an additional $40 million. $40 million. Um, 
these are programs that haven't been around um, 15 years ago. Um, he's also uh, expanding um, private vouchers. The EdChoice voucher is being expanded to include um, what has primarily been only a practice in the Cleveland voucher system, which is if students are 200% below the poverty line, they would now be eligible for these vouchers okay. so that they could be taken out of the public school district and placed into a private school, a parochial school. Um, we also see that the uh, funding for traditional public schools, um, that funding is actually in the crosshairs um, if we look at it. There have been guaranteed funds over the last 15 years that have supported these districts as enrollment has declined. Um, we know that um, money follows students into a district, mm -hmm. and if a student leaves a district, the money follows a student out of the district. So a lot of the districts, including Akron, which has seen um, considerable declines in enrollment, um, have been supported by guaranteed funds so that their funding levels don't decrease as these enrollment numbers decrease. Um, those numbers are beginning to be phased out um, in the second year of this budget. Okay. Um, about $48 million would be removed from those guarantee funds for our traditional public schools in the second year. And this is on top of what the governor projects as a 1% decrease in property values. Now, right. what that means is $50 million statewide, less local tax revenue. So you have $50 million um, shortfall with an additional 48, you're looking at about $100 million less for traditional public schools in the second year of the budget. Um, and he's making up for this with what are called targeted resources. Um, so not to um, convolute yeah, the I'm conversation, smile here, so. yeah. but you have to look at the school funding formula as his mechanism for um, really distributing this money mm -hmm. and answering a question um, or, or correcting um, a Supreme Court decision that he's saying his three previous governors haven't been able to do. Well, we got to, yeah. if I could jump in here, I mean, this is a, this is a, uh, first of all, this guarantee is a, is a big thing, and the, the phasing out of it just is going to happen, uh, gee, after the governor is up for re-election. Uh, gee. Uh, oh. You know, but if, if in the, for, for the first year of the biennium, the guarantee is in effect, mm -hmm. which is huge politically. Mm -hmm. I, I want to make that point. The second thing is that, that I'd like to say is that this discussion, has, as I gather, has been mostly about equity, which is a fine subject to discuss because Ohio has very disparate property tax wealth, as we know. So the governor's talking about equity. Well, what's not getting proper attention is adequacy. Right. Is and this that, a, was, that was the Supreme Court decision. And the attention that we did get on adequacy is that the governor wasn't taking a stab at adequacy with this funding formula. And by adequacy, we mean what is the proper level of funding needed to provide a proper education? So what do we need to provide so that students aren't walking a mile to school for busing? Um, what do they need as far as arts programs, AP class offerings? These disparities are very prevalent in our poorest and our richest districts. And that's where we kind of get into the equity issue. Um, are our poorest districts getting the level of funding that they need um, knowing that we can't raise the, uh, the local tax revenues that we can in our, our largest or our most um, property-rich districts. Yeah. Well, and, and that's one of the things I wanted to ask. Does this, does this budget do anything, this education spending plan, do anything to eliminate the reliance on local property taxes? What we're finding, and this is what we'll be uh, exploring in the next couple weeks at the Beacon, is under the 2011 figures, which would be the last year of Kasich's um, budget, um, how does the distribution to poor and rich districts differ than Kasich's new funding formula? Mm -hmm. And what we're finding is that the richer districts are going to be getting a little bit less in state aid. Right. But the poorest districts, um, from our preliminary analysis, is that they're receiving essentially almost exactly the same amount of funding. Um, and this, uh, this new funding formula was based on a wealth distribution. I just okay. want to make sure everybody understands that it was based on our richest districts and making sure that all the rest of the districts had the luxury of raising, mm -hmm. of raising those raising funds them. as well. That is the first tier of funding in this formula. So. Well, I know we're going to be discussing this, obviously, because, because although he's, the governor's presented these plans, it all has to pass through the legislature, right? So there's going to be some... some and, and his own party is not real happy with some parts of this either. Well, so he's going to have a real thing. fight, especially on the, the Medicaid mm -hmm. plan. He's, they're not happy with this. They don't like, you know, Obamacare. And so he's gonna. That's gonna be a tough road for him to hoe you know, to, to get his party, you know, in the in the house well, to approve got, this. Right, and or, he's also got a fight on his hand with his sales tax uh, issue because uh, the service providers 
they're, they're are, going to be are very opposed up in to arms. this. Absolutely. And there's a wrinkle here. We could get into it later, I suppose. There's a wrinkle here for local governments, but the the idea yes. is that yes. if you have a local sales tax levy, it's it will it's going to be adjusted because your base is broadening. Right. Exactly. So they're going so to they're going to take some some of that down. Yeah. For more Newsnight content, including extended discussions, full interviews, and the chance to speak your mind about the issues, join us online at Newsnight.net. Don't forget, you can always go to Newsnight.net to check out other archived programs, read our blog, and, and weigh in on the issues if you would like. In about the five minutes we have left here, gentlemen, um, I want to do some quick takes on a couple of things that have come up in the last couple of weeks. First of all, um, First Energy and their, the announcement that they, in fact, are going to be, they have the naming rights now for the Cleveland Browns Stadium. It will be First Energy Stadium, home of the Cleveland Browns. $102 million? You know what, how much advertising you get, uh, not only on all the, the networks that carry, uh, you know, uh, the NFL, you know, the CBS, NBC, ESPN, you know, uh, the NFL network. Uh, can you imagine how much publicity that buys? And look how over a, so many year period that they have it on there. 17 years. Mm -hmm. That's a worthwhile investment for them just to get their name out there. Everybody's going to remember if they see Brown Stadium, First Energy. It's going to be right there in front of them. And the, the, the branding that they're going to have with that football team, okay, and with, the, with that city, even though the stadium isn't supplied by First Energy, it's Cleveland Public Power, but they have a working relationship. We got Tony Alexander to quickly explain that, you know, that they, and, and we ask him what happens if the lights go out like they did at the Superdome, you know, during mm -hmm. the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. well, you know, is that going to be embarrassing for you? And, you know, he, he sort of skirted around that question. But just think of the publicity that they get from having that up there in, in lights. Yes. Well, yeah, I know that, but, but okay, last fall they laid off people. Um, they're having problems with health benefits. Um, you know, it, it, it sometimes, I think there are some people with whom it left a sour taste in their mouths. Yeah, there was definitely some blowback. Uh, we got several letters to the editor on those issues, on the layoffs and on the reduction of health care for retirees. Um, it seemed to die out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And as Larry's saying, you know, this is a long-term deal that gives them national exposure, national publicity, and it's it's difficult to put a hard number on it. But to have your name associated with that constantly, every time they talk about the game, uh, you know, it's going to be the game at First Energy. Well, what's it called? First Energy. First Energy, First Energy Stadium, home, home of the, the Cleveland, Cleveland Browns. Browns. Okay, whatever that. With the colon. Is, it's like a Metro Park serving Summit County. Yeah, and, true, you know. true. And this leads me to believe that First Energy is going to be uh, making more acquisitions. I think they want a more of a national footprint. Okay, they're on the East Coast right now in the Midwest, but I think this this is sort of a hint in the future that they want their branding to expand maybe further out to the Midwest, maybe, you know, start going west. Okay. And if that happens, then that is an investment for them to get that name in front of everybody so everybody becomes familiar with this big conglomerate that provides their power. One of the other things that has happened recently in the city of Akron was, was the, the incident with the uh, veterans' home, uh, Larry Modick. Um, and, and I guess I have to ask, was this much ado about nothing? Well, it's, yeah, in my opinion, yes, it was much ado about nothing. I feel, you know, everyone felt badly right. for what happened to this guy. But, you know, the short take on it is that he had several opportunities to show up uh, as this process went forward. He failed to do so. And I think what, now, you know, the city council is looking at legislation that would tighten up penalties for disclosure. Mm -hmm. And I think that it could be a positive step. They're proceeding carefully as they should. But the, the question really, to me, with, with the Modic case and moving forward is, you know, the seller really had an obligation. Right. And, and this guy had no clue that his house right. was in this degree of difficulty. Right. And Sorry. I understand there's a movement, uh, as a matter of fact, the, the Beacon Journal is reporting, there's a movement to try to raise money to mm -hmm. either rebuild a house there or to get him another house. Mm -hmm. So there might be a happy ending to this after all. One of the things we might see from Akron City Council in the next couple of weeks happens to be the texting ban that I think um, uh, would be even more stringent than the, the statewide ban. Do you think that has any legs? Sure, sure. I think it does. I mean, uh, there are a lot of studies out there that uh, the proponents are happy to share with you mm -hmm. uh, about how texting while driving is worse than being uh, uh, yeah. drinking. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you see it. I mean, if you're driving around, uh, especially, you know, someone is in front of you and the light turns green and it takes them, you know, 15 seconds to take off of the intersection, it's usually because they're either texting or they're on their phone like this, you know, because you look, you know, sure enough, about nine times out of ten they've been distracted by either their smartphone or they've been texting on the smartphone or whatever, and, you know, and they're not paying attention 
you know, to the road like they should. Making this a prime, there was there were some objections before the council, but making this a primary offense, mm -hmm. which means a police officer could stop you. Um, I don't know how that works, to be honest. Uh, well, you know, how do you know if somebody's texting unless you see them uh, uh, blatantly, right. you know, violate a traffic law, and you say, well. You know, a reasonable person wouldn't have done that unless they were distracted. I think that there has to be some sort of a, you know, uh, a guideline here of how you would stop somebody to check to see if they're texting and driving. Yeah. And, and the pra as a practical matter, I mean, the Akron police are going to respond to other things as a priority. I mean, Rather than the even texting. if you make it a primary offense, they're not going to start blanketing the city with people who are like looking in over the steering wheel, you know, are you texting? Well, and, and the final thing I want to say is, is go Zips. Um, yeah, at Hill, the men's basketball team, longest winning streak in the nation right That's now right. at 14 so games. Finally getting some long overdue national you know, recognition. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. so hopefully it bodes well for the MAC tournament yes. and then the NCAA tournament. March Madness. Um, Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Thank you, Doug. Larry, thank you. It's always a pleasure. And we want to thank you for joining us, and we hope you will be with us next time for Newsnight. Good night.